Um, before we begin our annual meeting, I don't know if you managed to hear that in the midst of the prayers of the people today, we were celebrating a birthday. So I thought it'd be really, really fun if we sang Thelma Happy Birthday from St. Bartholomew's today. So are you ready? Happy birthday to you. still up and functioning here at St. Bartholomew, so we're grateful for that. And now we're ready for our annual meeting. And so thank you also to staying, and thank you for our food. Now shut up. Hmm? Oh, can I do that one more thing? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so next Sunday, we are gonna have a fantastic faith forum on something called crowns. In the community of those of African descent, the hats that they wear to church are called crowns. Isn't that wonderful? If you think about that. So we're going to spend some time during Faith Forum looking at that. But I am inviting every single one of us to come to church, whether it's on Zoom or here per, on site with a hat next week, right? Male and female, okay? Right. Yeah, I, <laughs> I knew you'd like that, Neville. Uh, so please remember to wear a hat so that we can celebrate crowns and all that they mean to us. <laughs> See you all at the mall right after this meeting. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I am Angel Jackson, this year's senior warden. My name tag's in the car, but I know you all have yours on, right? Okay. It's so lovely to see all of you here who are so interested in the work and operation of the church. Your presence is very important. Thank you. Let us begin with a prayer. Spirit of the living God, breathe, move, and inspire us. Speak to us through our intuition. Bless the wisdom of our bodies and make our ears sharp to hear your voice. God of all blessings, Shape us, mold us, fill us, guide us, embrace us, so that we may be prepared for all the work that you would have us do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, as usual, we're going to start this meeting with norms. For those of you who are joining us on Zoom, hello to everyone on Zoom. Wave back to me, Bonnie, so I can see that you hear me. Bonnie, wave to me. Bonnie. Amen. Bonnie. Thank you. Okay, got it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no. Start with behavior for participating in this meeting. For those of you who are joining on Zoom, if you have something to contribute, please put that in the chat. And our able Vertec Verger, Patrick Mellon, will bring that to our attention. No. So, oh. what are the norms you and our, oh, so these are the norms we had at the last community conversation. So I thought we'd start with these, and then if there are others you would like to add, we can do that. So the traditional norms are respect all opinions. Uh, Zoomers uh, will be ID'd if they do in include, include a question or a comment or, or norm. No side conversations, not in person, not on Zoom. Do not abuse the chat room. One voice at a time. Please use I statements. Share discomfort in a timely way and please mute your phones. <laughs> Why are you turning around, Inez? <laughs> okay. Are there any other norms you would like to include? Yes, David. Please be brief and to the point so that everyone has their opportunity. Please be brief and to the point. This is not the time for your dissertation. Okay. Please measure your name. Please share your name. Very good. Not everyone. What's yours? 
<laughs> <Not that. laughs> Thank you, Neville. Any requests for norms from our Zoomers, Patrick? Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to the agenda, which is on page one of your booklet. We will begin with acceptance of last year's annual meeting minutes. They are on pages two and three of your booklet. And I'm sure you all had a chance to read them. Yes, John. Can you, okay, repeat that one more time and stand up and loud, please. I'm John Schrader, I'm the treasurer. If you look at page two, the fourth paragraph down, it says we received a $63,500 PPP loan. I just want to make a comment, it was really $62,500. 62. 62, not 63. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Diane. Diane Mountain. I'm the chair of the um, funds committee, and um, I also have a correction on page two. The second paragraph, the fourth, um, the fourth paragraph down, uh, where it says these are two-year terms, they're actually three-year terms on the funds committee. So the terms for the funds committee are not two years, as it says in the booklet, they are three years for members serving on the funds committee. Thank you, Diane. Okay, any other questions, concerns, comments, additions, corrections? Excellent, then we need a motion to approve the minutes from last year's annual meeting as corrected. I can't see who's behind you, Donna. Oh, Dave, uh, <laughs> Tom. The motion put forward by Tom Cover and seconded by Donna Cartwright. All those in favor with a show of hands. Zoomers, you may show your hands also. That is a majority. Thank you so much. Moving on to the annual reports. All the working committees of the, of the church do submit their annual reports. They are included within your booklet. Committee reports. We're not going to review each one individually, but if you would look at the one that you submitted, <laughs> if you have any corrections, changes. They begin on page nine, committee reports beginning with worship committee, going on to acolytes, Christian meditation, and so on. We're not going to review each individual report. They are there for you to peruse. We need a motion to accept the annual reports as submitted. Motion submitted by David Mountain, seconded by Dave Murray. Thank you. All those in favor of submitting the annual, the committee reports, please raise your hand. Zoomers, you may raise your hands as well. That is a majority. Thank you very much. Can I just interrupt? For a sure. So I do want to point out to you all that in the back of the annual reports is this wonderful section called An Invitation to Ministry Time and Talent in 2022. This has been put forward by our wonderful stewardship team and it talks about all the different ways that people can be a part of the ministry at St. Bartholomew's. 
There's so many wonderful things that we do here, so please take a peek at that. And if there's something that catches your attention and you would like to participate in, I hope that you'll fill that out and let us know. That's on page 47 of your booklet. All are welcome. Okay. So, and a very important part of the annual meeting is the financial report. We have the pleasure of our finance director zooming in from, where in the world are you, Michael? Michael Haney, you are muted. I have no idea where I am, but. I can't hear him. I say, can you hear me now? Can everyone hear me? There he is. There you go. We great, hear you, Michael. Great, great. Uh oh. I have no idea where I am. In the background, it says I'm at St. D's, but good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? And thank you so much, Angel. Um, it's always a uh, pleasure to uh, be at the annual meeting, particularly when we had as decent a year given situations that we've encountered the past couple of years as we did last year. And I'd like to uh, call on John Schrader and John DeVale to assist me during the course of hopefully what will be a very concise and succinct report. And before I get started, I definitely would like to recognize the members of the uh, Finance Committee uh, because the attention uh, and the work that's been put in the past couple of years has uh, been without precedent. So I'd like to recognize particularly our pastor, uh, Florence Ledyard, our senior warden, Angel Jackson, our junior warden, Michael Sarbanes, Robin Mary, who's been on the finance committee for, uh, well, Robin, don't get me, but decades, uh, Drew Brown, Dick Parker, Corinne Bowmaker, uh, John Schrader and John DeVale, Bates Churchill, two, rec two uh, representatives of the, of the vestry, Gordon Peach and Bonnie Kutch. So all of these uh, good souls uh, were instrumental in guiding us over the course of the past two years, and particularly the year we're speaking of, 2021. And so 2021 ended uh, with a surplus for the church of $19,708 when we were initially uh, earmarked for a deficit. Now, much of this was uh, due to the payroll protection program loan that we sought in 2020 that was ultimately forgiven, uh, meaning we did not have to pay this loan back. So we were able to book it as a income source in 2021. But the bottom line is that the church finished uh, a deficit budget on a positive note of $19,708.37, which according to the church bylaws was then sent to the prior year reserve fund. So we finished in a very good way. Just to give you a sense of uh, where we are as it relates to, because I was asked to give you a sense of the future for us. Um, for the past few years now, I rely on John DeVale, who is our assistant treasurer and oversees our pledgers. Um, last year, we uh, had very good pledge income. Uh, the year before we had very good open plate income for whatever reasons. Uh, but we have been seeing over the course of the past few years, a decrease of almost 20% of pledgers. And pledging equates to about 90% and in some years better of our income. So it's something that we have to be concerned with, something that we have to look at. This year, for instance, in 2022, we've only increased the revenue for the church over what we actually finished at last year by just over $2,000. So we only increased our income for 2022, $2,000 over where we actually finished at in 2021. And when you look at the bottom line, the deficit, because we are a faith-based church and we operate on a faith budget, we always, we don't balance a budget, meaning that a zero balance, we only spend what we take in. We believe that our faith and our ministries will get us where we need to go at the end of the year. And it has proved true, I'd say 80% of the time over the course of the past 
10, 15 years, we always come through and we erode or erase any deficit. But this year, 2022, we are projecting a deficit of $38,448, which is a increase over last year of only $8,800. And much of the deficit increase of 2022 is to ensure that we acknowledge our paid staff. You know, our human resources are what we believe are our most precious commodity at St. Bartholomew. So we wanted to ensure the vestry agreed to what the finance committee recommended. And we uh, ensured that our, our staff was taken care of as seemed to be the case around the country and the world, making sure that human resources were taken care of. So our, our, our increased deficit over last year, over $8,000. The concern that we have uh, in finance, as I mentioned, is with pledge income. We finished last year at, I believe, 127 pledgers, which was slightly down from 2020, which going into 2022 at this moment, I think we're somewhere around 102 pledgers. So even in this year, we're in May, we're 25 pledgers down. So what has happened, we've seen over the past couple of years, those that are pledging have given more for whatever reasons, either recognizing the opportunity that the church is in or just able to give more. But you know, one of the things that we did with finance last year is that we divided into subcommittees to look and delve further into some of the opportunities with the church. Last year, we did a subcommittee on major maintenance. We did a subcommittee on um, uh, budgeting so that we can look at presenting multiple year budgets so that we can better anticipate uh, any concerns we have coming up in the future. And this year, one of the things that we're gonna focus on and hopefully working with stewardship and funds committee and the vestry is compensation as well as figuring out what other opportunities lie for us with income. Because we know as we become an older church and we begin to look at transitioning ministry, you know, uh, uh, Flo is uh, at a point where she's going to retire and fish 100% of the time. And what does it look like in the future for us from a compensation standpoint? What is the next rector's uh, thoughts in terms of deficit budget? So we figure that we may want to get ahead of the curb, share with you where the opportunity is, and understand while we're in a good situation from an asset perspective, uh, St. Bartholomew's, in my opinion, is in a very good place from an asset perspective. Uh, a perspective, but from an operating perspective, operating year over year, the income that we take in annually to take care of the needs that we have on an annual basis, there are some opportunities in that regard. So thank you so much, Angel. Thank everyone for listening to me. And if there are any questions that you may have for me or for John or John DeBale and John Schrader, be happy to take them at this time. Yes, we, we do have one question. We have a question from Deirdre that is the pledger number, the number of pledge commitments submitted or is the number of pledges received? So that's a great question. If John DeVale is there, I can answer that question, but I prefer that if John DeVale is there that he answer that question. John is not, was not able to be with us today. Michael. Okay, so, so no, okay, oh. so typically, typically, and we've seen it last year, I think we, we were able to absorb almost 100% of the pledge commitments. Uh, in prior years, we'd get to 97%, 98%, percent meaning that if we had 100 people that said they were going to pledge, that we would do at least 97 to 98. And I believe last year, we got to 99.9 .9 and may have gone slightly over, however, you can go over 100%. But that did not seem to be the issue. But great question, Deirdre. Any other questions from our Zoomers? 
Any other questions for Michael? Okay. That doesn't require a motion. Great, okay. Thank you, Michael. Um, another you. important aspect of the finances of the committee of the church, uh, Diane Mountain will give us a report from the fund Should committee. Should I use that microphone, please? Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Hi, Diane Mountain, chair of the um, uh, incoming chair. I've just finished my, um, I guess my first year as uh, chair of the funds committee. Um, and this is an advisory committee to the vestry um, because the vestry is definitely the, the decision-making body when it comes to um, all things financial for the church. But we, um, uh, we keep watch over the um, Mission Endowment Fund, and, um, and we also liaison directly with our, um, uh, our financial advisor and our um, uh, managed account managers at uh, 1919 Investment Council, where the funds are actually um, invested. So. Um, we submitted a, uh, a report. It starts on page 27 of your booklet. Um, it's, um, it's got uh, some information about the background of the, of the um, endowment fund and the most recent um, financial performance. Our financial year, our fiscal year for the uh, endowment fund is from um, the beginning of October to the end of September. So. The numbers that you'll see on page 27 reflect uh, from the end of September 2020 through um, the end of September 2021. That's the, the formal fiscal year. And then we also include the next quarter, which represented the end of 2021, to be in line with the uh, church's calendar and budget year. Um, as, uh, as anybody who's following the stock market knows, um, 2021 was, uh, was a, a long um, uh, uphill and kind of peaked pretty much right at the end of the calendar year. And since then, um, it is declining. It has been declining at times rather uh, precipitously. But um, I'm happy to report that, um, well, I mean, we're, it, the the investment fund in this in this quarter current quarter has gone down along with the market but um, but throughout 2021 um, as well as um, as well as up to today the committee is in frequent conversation with our financial advisor and with our um, investment uh, council and we are uh, collectively doing our best to make sure that we're um, balancing risk, that we're well diversified. And um, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to um, see me after the meeting, but if, there are, if you wanna get into any more details. But are there any sort of general questions about the, about the committee um, or any of the information in the booklet? That, yeah, Drew. Wait a minute. <coughs> Sorry, Drew. Brown and uh, can we see uh, it, the funds that we are invested in? Is that published? Um, it's not right now, but I can certainly. Oh, microphone. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Otherwise, our Zoomers can't hear. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand. <laughs> um, good question. Yeah. I mean, there, it's nothing secret. Um, it's uh, um, we we don't we don't invest in funds. We don't invest in like index funds. Um, we invest in individual stocks. Okay. So we can get anybody, anybody who's interested can contact me and I can get you a list of the stocks that we, of course it changes from time to time. So, you know, every month we have a, every month we get a statement that says what they've bought and sold. And then I believe I believe we only get annually a report from 1919 about, you know, what we're currently holding and all that stuff. So um, there is going to be a meeting with our annual meeting with 1919 is next Monday, the 9th of May, a week from tomorrow. So um, 
and uh, anybody on the Finance Committee is welcome to come and join. <laughs> and anybody is welcome to join on Zoom. There will be a, a, um, information on that link going out. Yeah. Anything else? Any questions on Zoom? Um, I just want to gently remind you all that um, uh, that our in, all of our invested funds are ESG invested. They're SRI, socially responsibly invested. We have an investment policy um, to stipulate what that means and what we will invest in and what we won't that was approved a number of years ago now by the vestry. All of that is available as well as looking at the specificity of what we are invested in. Diane would be a great person to... Uh, funnel your questions and your concerns through. Um, I do want to say that one of the joys of being the rector is that I have the high privilege of being able to appoint people to the endowment fund. So if you look on page 27, you will notice <clears throat> that there are certain people who are on the funds committee, whether they want to be or not. Um, one is uh, the chair of our finance committee, which is Michael Haney. The other is the chair of stewardship, which is, of course, our lovely Sarah Schrader, who's doing such a great job. And then um, our, our senior warden is a member of the funds committee. So you are on the funds committee by virtue of those positions. But we also have three at-large members who ro rotate through. So every... Uh, so I... So the rector has the privilege of appointing somebody every year to that, to that rotating group. And so I'm delighted to be able to say that um, as, um, uh, hang on, let me get back to that bit, right, as Bonnie Kutch is um, rotated, no, no, she's not, she's on, she's staying on. So we have two members that are still on, Bonnie Kutch, who's our recording person, and Adrian Barnes Haney, who is, who is the newest member. Diane has just completed her first three-year term, and so we get to appoint her again to another three-year term, and that's exactly what I am doing. Uh, <laughs> um, I can tell you there was incredible relief on your rector's part when we computed that all out, because Diane is doing such a superb job in watching over that whole investment process and making sure that we're being attentive. And so her gift of being able to provide that ongoing stability is huge. So Diane is gonna go on for another three-year term. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. The annual meeting is the time when we get to say goodbye to three members, four members who are rotating off of the vestry. And we'd like to honor them at this time. They did a stellar job guiding us, leading us, working through the pandemic. And they are definitely, the, the joy is, although they'll leave the vestry, they'll stay here <laughs> and then we'll get to see them often. Um, Dick Parker, Dick, can you see, can see you? <laughs> you know, I have just a minute to chat with Dick before the meeting. He is the sharpest 96-year-old guy on the planet. I, I wish I'd met him 20 years ago. I wish I'd known him during his working life. I'm sure there was a lot he could have offered to me in the way of mentorship and wisdom. Thank you, Dick. You've held a, a wonderful world. Dick gave a close eye, close eye to those for financial reports, and we are grateful, grateful for your contribution. Also leaving us is Susan Gehring. I don't think Susan's here today. Susan was our green conscience. So as every issue was presented to the vestry, if it had anything to do with an environmental concern, Susan was the one to bring us to that, uh, that to our attention. Uh, we're going to be losing Bonnie Koch, Bonnie had a wonderful eye for detail. I could always count on her to, in the event, there was something that I, or the rector, <laughs> may, may have forgotten or missed. Bonnie was always the one to bring that to our attention. And Rachel Sangri, Rachel's here. Say hello, Rachel. Will be leaving us quiet soul, but wonderful in her discerning wisdom, a great part of the vestry. Thank you for your service.
so the vestry has provided to you a slate of people to be um, nominated for membership this year to the vestry. They appear, their bios and their pictures appear on pages four and five of your booklet. And they are Terry Amon. Terry is here. Wait, Terry, thank you. Ben Barone. Ben was not able to join us today. Iadel House. Iadel is on Zoom today. And Dana Rose. Dana is here as well. Ooh, excitement. Okay. So that is your slate as, as submitted by the Vestry Nominating Committee. Uh, the parish bylaws also permit additional nominations from the floor. Any person nominated must have already agreed to be nominated and must be a member in good standing as determined by the rector and assistant treasurer. No nominations from the floor. Oh, here we go. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to do that. <laughs> So, are there any nominations from the floor? Check the Zoomers. Any nominations on Zoom? Nothing from Zoom. Okay. So, this is your slate of people recommended for membership on the vestry. Can we, by acclamation, yeah. accept this nomination? <laughs> Thank you, new vestry members. You can expect an email from me this evening. <laughs> we get right to work. Okay, moving on to community conversation number three. Good afternoon. Good morning. This afternoon, everybody. Still morning. <laughs> um, this is our uh, third revisiting of our community conversation around clergy options, and. Um, just one of the things I want to say is that it's been a process of clarification for the wardens, for the vestry, uh, and for flow as we've gone through this. And the, every meeting has clarified things um, and helped us to think more clearly about it. Um, the guiding norms are on page one. These are the same norms that we've used for the last two about this. I just want to emphasize that we've been guided by this sort of the first three, which is that we want to be faithful in the conversation, we want to be fair, and we want to seek what's beneficial to St. B's uh, in the long term. Um, I'm just going to really quickly go over what the options are. We have one option that is kind of new that came out of some of the feedback we got after the last meeting, and I'll get to that one in a second. Uh, but just to review, so sort of the first option was you know, we generally called that flow stays for a little while. And that was either associate rector, so hiring an associate rector, that is not a tenured position, um, but, and it would be, uh, you would have to sort of clarify the roles, flows time would be significantly reduced uh, very quickly. And it sort of um, would be a period of time of seeing if that associate rector works out and if that's who we want to uh, go forward with, but if we don't decide to go with that associate rector, then we do the full search starting whenever we get to that point. Another option under that flow stays for a little while is the co-rector, and that would be a full search process, uh, and then have someone to come in and work with flow for about six months to a year, and then they become the rector. Once that person is hired as a co-rector, they do have tenure. That's the, that would be the, uh, the new rector. Uh, when flow uh, finishes that period. So that was kind of the option one. We talked about uh, those possibilities uh, in the last, uh, last couple of meetings. Uh, option two on the next page is basically the sort of normative search process for uh, a congregation, uh, which is that we would uh, hire an interim rector. And last time, Thelma kind of walked us through what that means and what the uh, possibilities are. Thelma's here today if we still have questions about that. Um, and then we do the search process. At the first meeting, we kind of walked through like the 15 or 16 steps that would be involved in that. It's pretty uh, detailed, but it's basically is going through the normative process for hiring a new rector. 
Um, option three is something that came out of some of the feedback that we got from people. And it's a little bit, you might say it's like option two A, but it's sort of in between the two options. And the idea in this is that we, we begin the search for a new rector and we hire an interim rector kind of as we would, but in certain bodies of work um, that were carefully defined that we think Flo's presence, her personal presence in those bodies of work is important in terms of where they are, that Flo would continue in a capacity and doing those work. So we kind of, the idea is that these would be bodies of work where it's happening right now, like it's an active current development where the, it's at an important inflection point. In other words, that uh, there are things happening with it right now that are significant that we wouldn't want to lose, the timing matters, that moving that work forward depends on relationships that Flo has. In other words, relationship intensive, intensive with her. As you know, St. Bees is a very strong lay leadership congregation. So typically what happens is in these bodies of work, lay leadership you know, ends up uh, picking them up. But right now, there, there may be some where it's like right now, Flo's holding the relationships in a way that we don't, we would lose a lot if, um, uh, if she weren't involved in it in this particular time. And that's the fourth criteria. We might lose some critical momentum if the work, if the work were paused or sort of put, uh, put more on a back burner. So, for example, if you think, well, what might this mean? There's sort of some interrelated bodies of work, um, and there, you know, there may be others that the vestry would look at. And this would, this option would require a very careful kind of clarification of the roles and being very specific about it. Um, so, one, for example, might be the follow-up with the Christianity and Racism Task Force, which is just has its first meeting on Tuesday. And it's something that kind of emerges out of work that we've been doing over a long period of time, deeply anchored in the history of the church and the way the congregation has been embracing that history. Um, a second is the potential transition of Hope Harbor into a housing equity focus. So one of our strategic imperatives in our strategic plan was the establishment of a CDC. And we have done that, we have Hope Harbor. And there is a very active conversation going on right now about with other churches and city officials along the Edmonds Avenue corridor about Hope Harbor potentially moving into a focus on housing equity. And I think you could see how that might tie into the Christianity and Racism Task Force conversation since that's a lot of what that, uh, that conversation was. Um, and then a third role that might fit into this is uh, St. B's is part of a citywide uh, coalition of congregations called ACT Now, and we are the 8th uh, District hub for that. Um, but that coalition is of um, clergy people uh, rather than it being sort of formal institutions um, and so just at, at the moment, that's something that is also a set of relationships that flow has been happening. So the idea is that this would uh, sustain kind of uh, the work in the community, sustain momentum in that, um, that has emerged by having the same very uh, highly respected, very able rector for 20 years. Um, and to not try to, uh, to not lose momentum in that. So that's, that would be an example of it, but we'd have to really define that uh, really clearly. We'll do questions in a sec. Um, and then eventually, when we have a new rector, uh, Flo would transition this work to the new rector or to lay leadership in the congregation. So again, that would be sort of for a defined, relatively short uh, period of time. But that's, that's a, this option three is sort of something that is different from what we talked about before, and it really came out of a number of uh, uh, converse, conversations and emails that we uh, received. In there. So we want to take time now and do, let me just do the guidepost and then we'll get to questions, okay? So the last page is just, again, flows guideposts that we talked about before. Don't settle, don't hire someone inexperienced, get someone who's comfortable with shared leadership, do the process in our own way, not in a reactive way. 
be clear about our norms, and be clear about what's essential for St. Bees. So what we want to do now is take time for questions about any of this now. And then if we get through the questions and time permits, we'd like to break kind of organically into small groups with the idea that everybody gets a chance to think about it, articulate it, voice it, because sometimes that actually helps to clarify our thinking. OK, first question. And please come to the microphone and identify yourself for questions. Sure. Chuck Sullivan. I'm assuming since you went through option three, that Flo has agreed to that? <laughs> Uh, I suppose that's actually a legitimate question, isn't it? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, what I think is really important is to understand about option three is that we need to make very sure that um, it's on, Brian, or Patrick. I think with option three, what we would need to do is to be very, very clear about how we are negotiating with the new interim rector. And then we would have to be very, very clear about boundaries um, and about my boundaries around me. The things that, that Michael mentioned on that sheet of paper are all things that I have some real joy and excitement about. I think there are some things that are gonna be happening that are gonna be very transformative for our community, but also for St. Bartholomew's and continue to help us grow in strength and in vision and mission. Um, but if we do that, um, I, I would need to know that we have very, very clear boundaries and that an interim that we would hire would be amenable to that. And so that's all part of the negotiations. So my ability to say yes is that I'm pretty excited about it, <laughs> but I would not want to say axiomatically yes until we engage in that kind of um, negotiation. Okay. <clears throat> Flo, there yes. is a question on Zoom uh, yep. on what do you personally think of option three? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, again, I think it depends on the boundaries that we would establish. I think it's very, boundaries really, really matter. And you all know that boundaries are essential. They're part of what keep a community healthy and strong and clear and transparent. And so if we, conf if, if we hired, an, if you all hired an interim, right, watch my language, if you all hire an interim who is willing to engage in that kind of conversation because they see that as an asset to the ongoing work of this congregation, then I am absolutely ready to do that negotiating. And I think it could be kind of interesting and kind of intriguing. I do wanna be quick to say, it would be very new. <laughs> this is not the norm, right? Not that St. Bartholomew's y'all are ever the norm, but, but that would not be the norm. Uh, that would ha that's why the negotiations would really, really have to be very, very clear and very, very precise. And I would have to be very, very well boundaried about that. So you would not see me at church on Sunday right? You would not see me at an annual meeting, probably, but you would through, you would not see me at the hospital. If we hire an interim, we need to give the interim the space to do what they do so stunningly well. And that interim role is going to be critically important for St. Bartholomew's as you all move forward. And finding a really exquisite interim is also part of the timing of things, right? And the gift is that we have Thelma Smullen, who has been an extraordinary interim herself, who will be there to help guide through that. And once that is happening, the interim is just not going to have the time to do these other things, right? The interim needs to be here to be with you, to take care of the things that you expect from your interim rector, worship pastoral care, helping guide you through your search process. There are lots of things that an interim rector is gonna to bring to you. They are not gonna have the time, I don't think, Thelma and I've had a conversation about this, they're not gonna have the time to do some of this work uh, down the avenue. Does that mean that you all can't do the work? No, You're, Michael mentioned it, the leadership in this congregation is exceptional and it's extraordinary. So we can find ways to continue to do that. So I think a lot of us will depend again on an, who the interim is and how we can negotiate clear boundaries so that um, as we go through a time of transition and those ministries are rising, we can go through a time of transition for me involved in them as well. Daphne, Daphne Cover. Um, 
I may have missed something at the beginning of this meeting. Uh, so my question really has to do with, is the annual meeting over and now we're talking about this or are we coming back to annual meeting stuff? Because my question has to do with Project Jigsaw. And when I saw the list of things that are continuing or that have already been started and are continuing, that wasn't mentioned as something that uh, Flo would be involved in. And so I'm just kind of wondering where, I read the description about Project Jigsaw in the report, but I'm just kind of curious about where we are with that and do we see that as something that's just gonna halt until we have a new rector or, and then we're gonna start talking about it all over again or where does that fit into this whole picture? Yeah, good question. question. <laughs> okay, um, what I really love is that none of you have forgotten about Project Jigsaw. I love that, it just constantly keeps coming up which tells me it's still in your heart and in your spirit. So let me just quickly say that Project Jigsaw has actually been doing some work this time, even during the pandemic. If you've been downstairs, you can see that we have an entirely refreshed downstairs, thanks to the work of 40 West Assistance and Referral Center in being able to go to Annapolis to get some grants and the money that we've already had in the Jigsaw Fund, which we can now match that money we get from Annapolis, we've been able to do projects all along that have been part of the Jigsaw uh, goal and the Jigsaw dream. As works with state money, right? When you get grants, you have to already have spent your share of that before they'll give you a nickel, much less a penny. So we are in the process of, of continuing to use money from the Jigsaw Fund to do Jigsaw projects, mostly down in the Undercroft area. And as soon as those, we reach certain levels, we'll be able to um, receive that money back from the state. In the meantime, what's going on right now is that Dave Murray and Nancy Case are working with 40 West Assistance and Referral Center to begin to look at some different access points into the Undercroft and also to look at the boiler, which was so much fun this past winter. <laughs> and so there are some projects that are pertinent to Jigsaw that are going on. However, what I do want to say to you all is that I think for Jigsaw to rise to its fullest self requires us as a congregation to be able to be back together in a way that feels that we have had time to recalibrate who we are as a congregation. As we've come, as we're, we're sort of hopefully coming out of the pandemic, sliding our way back towards some things, for Jigsaw to really have the energy and the clarity that is important for this congregation, I believe that it's gonna take some time for us to, to get beyond this, to recalibrate, and to understand who we are as we come out of a pandemic, right? Let's not assume that it's gonna be the same thing it was three years ago or two years ago. And so as we come out of the pandemic, we have a chance to sort of recalibrate, resettle, reconnect, understand who we are, I think out of that then comes the opportunity to think, all right, so where are we going? Are we going in the same direction we thought we were, right, when we passed Jigsaw? Or do we need to revisit the design of Jigsaw to accommodate how we are going to understand the way we function as we move forward? And that's gonna take time. It's gonna take time to come back and recalibrate. It's gonna take time to figure out how St. Bartholomew's understands itself as a community, how we understand how we're gonna function, how we understand where we're moving forward. And then it seems to me that's gonna require community conversation to reassess, are we on the right track? And do we, and then you need to revisit the plans. We need to look at the plans. Maybe the plans need to change to accommodate how we have become church coming out of this time. And then that needs a new price tag and that also will need a community conversation. It's my personal opinion that that's gonna take a couple of years to do. I don't think that's something that we should be doing right now um, because I would hope that we would not make a commitment to something that we are a little less clear is, is essential to our future. And so from that perspective, um, I have said to the wardens, I've said to our Jigsaw team and to the vestry, and I'm now saying to you all, I think that Jigsaw needs to continue to do the things that it can that make sense that we know we're going to do regardless. But I think that it's gonna take us some time 
to recalibrate as a congregation, to re um, to, to, to grab hold of who we are going to be as we come out of this. How awesome are we going to be, right? And what is that going to look like? And then how does that impact our plans for Jigsaw? Do we need to redo some of those? And then to have a new kind of conversation and then to make that commitment and move into fundraising. And so I am saying to you all that that, that is beyond my time with you. I just don't think that that's something you want to do with me. I think that's something you would want to do with a rector who's going to be around long enough <laughs> to help you do that and get the money raised, right? Okay. Hi, Margaret Engvall, and I was glad to hear that clarification. Uh, but I have another clarification. Everybody here in the back. Okay. No. Can you speak closer to the There you go. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. I, I did want another clarification because after one of the other meetings, uh, someone said to me, well, we'll get Thelma as the interim rector and we'll be fine. <laughs> and I just wanted to clarify, I think that this says she is going to clarify what the interim rector does, not become the interim rector. I just want to make that. So, you know, thanks for the 79th birthday. <laughs> So I am going to clarify that. Selma has been crystal clear from the start that she is not going to serve as your interim rector. And the truth of the matter is, is that I think that's good on a number of occasions, and it has nothing to do with her age because she has about more energy than, than a lot of people who are a lot younger have. So it's not about Thelma's age at all. But I do want to say Thelma's a member of this community. Thelma is a member of St. Bartholomew's. She can bring wisdom she can bring history, wisdom, experience, and all those wonderful things. But you need an interim who's going to come in from the outside. You need somebody who's going to come in with fresh eyes and clean ears and be able to share with you what that interim rector is hearing and understanding and, and help you hear yourselves better, see yourselves better, and have clarity about how you're moving forward. So actually, even if Thelma were seven... Teen, I wouldn't recommend that she be your your interim rector. Okay. But you need to get to the mic then. No. As your husband, you can probably pretty much do that. Yeah. It has to do with um, the role. If 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 it would go forward, that flow would continue to be active in a couple of these outreach things. What I would just like to clarify is there would be boundaries, but most of those boundaries are going to be more on flow side than the interim side. Because whoever is interim, in order to have a clear whole picture of this congregation, would have to be at least involved in those other things some, or they would have a blank spot and really couldn't do the work. So, no, Flaw wouldn't be here doing other things, but the interim would certainly be in on what's going on in what all the areas of the parish. I just want to clarify. Yeah, got it. Judy yeah. Sabalaskis, former, what was that? Way up there. Okay. okay. All right, Judy Sabalaskis, former registrar for seven years. <laughs> who went through all these vestry meetings and lots of things that we covered. And in 2019, we were at Claggett, and it was my, I announced that I was going to step down because I knew exactly how low it is because I'm exactly three weeks old. So, um, to the day, 21 days. So, I said, there has to be a transition between my role and the new, the new registrar needed to learn from Flo. So Flo, I got the impression of that meeting, that Flo wanted to go fishing, spend more time with her family, and do pursuits. So I'm happy to hear about this, this uh, third option. And interestingly enough, we were talking about whether Flo should leave earlier because of where Project Jigsaw was. So again, I'm glad this got brought up because all of the seeds of flow 
with the water. So I'm just adding a little historical perspective. Oh, and don't forget the red line might come back. <laughs> <laughs> and that is going to change the whole structure of our idea for project pizza. So that's, I'm happy to hear us moving this direction. Thanks, Judith. Any other questions or concerns? Okay. All right. So if you know that, what we want to do is we want to break in, and we're going to try and do this organically, which is going to be something. So this is in the realm of can you turn around comfortably and talk to somebody, which looks <laughs> kind of from here, Hello. say, to here, and here <clears throat> to Terry. And we're going to try to have a vestry member in each group. And what we want to do is ask groups to identify Thank somebody you. who will report out. And you're not giving like a case, you know, a, a, a summary of everything that was said, but just sort of, was there a sense of the group that okay. came out or were people all over the place? Like, and so we'll try to do that at the end. So we got that as a group. And then from, uh, what did I say, from Neville back? Yes. Yeah, from Neville back to Terry as a group. And then this is a third group. And then why don't we take, um, from here, uh, and Dana, could you join this and you all do this group? And you might have to move <laughs> to get a little closer to each other. So that would be a fourth group, and then fifth group up to you, Bob, does that work? Fifth group here, and then this group, oh, this group is, you're pretty tight. So, um, and uh, so really, we just wanna, and the idea is everybody get a chance to, just have your voice heard. So kind of go around and see like, where are people at? What do they think? And identify one person to report out and we'll take about right. can I, 20 can, minutes. Can I, before you all get going, I appreciate your energy. Let me just make a couple of comments to support Michael here. Uh, if you need to move to a place where it's a little bit quieter, please do that, but be sensitive about that. The thing I wanna be really clear about, we are not looking for a vote today. This is not about consensus building. This is about you all having a chance to now have a conversation together that you might not have had already. And so it's a chance to really say, all right, we've got a lot of options we've looked at. Let's have a conversation about what we're feeling about those, what we're thinking about them. And again, this is not to create a vote today. That, that, that is not what this is about. It's a chance for us to have a chance to, it's a chance to have some conversation, to share your thoughts and feelings and have questions that you might want. Our Zoomers are gonna do the same thing. Right. They're gonna go into breakout groups and hopefully we'll hear back from them as well. And so let's take um, 20, minutes. 20 minutes, all right? And Zoomers, please identify somebody in the group that will do your report yeah. out. Okay. All right, now talk. Yeah. And if you need so to switch around and go find I a group, go do it. Zoomers. Okay. <laughs> Patrick, can we start with the Zoom? Oh. Sure, that would be Sandy Rosenberger speaking for the Zoom group. Um, so there were a few themes that came up in our small group discussion. Um, I think the overriding theme for us was this idea of not being afraid to pull the Band-Aid off. In other words, that maybe option two might be the best choice. Um, we had discussion around option three as well, and there were points in favor of either one. Um, but some of the things that we discussed were the, um, the cost of option three and our concern within the budget for that. Um, also that we would need, you know, we have a concern for the operating budget itself and what the operating budget can sustain. So if we go with option three, we may have to be very creative about how we are able to fund um, Flo's consulting type position. Um, so that, that was one concern. But there also was the point made that we, we have really strong lay leadership here at St. B's and that many of our programs may be able to continue without having Flo kind of peering over our shoulders that, that we can do this, we're capable of doing this. Um, someone brought up the point about how a prospective interim might feel about having the former rector sort of, even though there are boundaries, they're kind of there, they're still present. Um, a new interim could bring new ideas for the ministries that we already have in place. And so that could also 
be a good thing. And maybe we just need to step out in faith and let the spirit work. So uh, those were some of the things that we discussed. Group members, if there's anything that I did not share that you feel is important, please take time to unmute now. Hey, Sandy, I know that David McClellan had his hand raised as they took us off, and I, I really was intrigued to hear from him. I didn't know if he still would, had something to say. Would you like to share, Dave McClellan? Well, um, I guess I was saying that if so long as the if for the uh, if Flo is working on some of these specific projects, and certainly it would be nice to have her continuing to work with uh, Hope Harbor, for instance, while the interim is here, that's not quite the same as trying to stay around when the next rector comes. Um, I mean, I. I I, I'm otherwise very sympathetic with the take off the band, take off the bandage. I know there's hesitancy because the last uh, new rector uh, search didn't work out the way we wanted, but I would remember that the one before that worked out excellently. So, you know, maybe we're due for an excellent uh, result this time. Was there, Patrick, was there, how many groups do we have on Zoom? One. The one, okay, all right, cool. Um, who wants to volunteer to summarize your group? Go ahead. My okay. wife volunteered. <laughs> Steve Mountain. Uh, Much closer I'm, to the mic. I'm representing the superstar seniors who were sitting up here in the front. <laughs> um, the general feeling from our group uh, was uh, somewhat similar to what Sandy said. It was, um, you know, the, uh, we'll call it the flow leaves versions of the options, which is, look, we're a strong congregation. Um, we know how to go through this. Uh, we've got Delma to help us from the, you know, make sure the interim rector, as, they, as we think about what they need to do, she can be a, a wise guide in that. Um, and so we need to trust the Holy Spirit and we need to say thank you to Flo um, for 20 years of incredible service to this congregation. 22, okay, if you say so. Um, anyway, but we did find the, we'll call it the special role option appealing with some very specific uh, thoughts, concerns, issues associated with that. Um, first of all, it, what is the budgetary impact? Is it minimal? Is it large? That would certainly be a factor. Um, the boundary issue, as Flo mentioned, uh, would be critical. Uh, things like uh, setting boundaries that exist in some way, not just from what Flo does or not, but things like um, it needs to end before the uh, next rector would be to show up, right? Or it needs to be only a year or things like that. So that, that there are those sorts of boundary issues. We actually, we're not concerned about flow stepping over boundaries. We're concerned about the congregation stepping across those boundaries and trying to reach out to flow during an interim rector type period. So we were, we were more concerned that that kind of boundary crossing would occur. Um, and um, I'm gonna echo because what I brought up was somewhat similar to David McClellan. In the specific case of Hope Harbor and some of those things, right now is actually kind of a critical time. There's a number of conversations going on where flows 20 year, 22 years worth of institutional leadership and um, relationship that she's built from the perspective of Hope Harbor make a big deal of difference right now. Um, and so there are certain types of special roles where it, where it might make sense uh, that are worthy of consideration, but they need to be done so in the context of these other issues and possible problems that might occur. But we were very much of the sentiment that uh, we need to let flow go and, uh, you know, go to New Zealand and go fishing. Um, and I guarantee you, Jesus will be on the shore there. With <laughs> go ahead, Celeste. Well, this is actually going to make this pretty easy because we echo everything that has already been said. So um, 
we were kind of divided. We had half of the group that, um, again, thinks that it's time to pull off the Band-Aid and is a little concerned about overlap with an interim being here and us stepping over those boundaries possibly. Um, but then we have people that are familiar with the projects that are going on, know Flo's passion for them, know her commitment, know where we are right now, and don't want to lose that important mentorship, um, continuity, culpability, um, an anchor, these are all key words that came up in the conversation. Um, they really feel like it, that needs to be um, a 50-50 decision where Flo herself decides what those boundaries are and allow her to be part of that decision-making and pick that concrete date. Um, so I think that's an important piece. Um, at least three of us mentioned that we like the idea of a more organic exit and allowing the spirit to be present and pick that concrete date, but allow that more of an organic coming together um, for that decision. Could, could you say a little bit more about what you mean by that? So, please. Um, you pick that concrete date, but let's say we're, we do really well with the interim and that interim is really strong. So you may decide you've picked that concrete data six months out, but four months in, you may go, ah, the interest gotcha. has got this. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> so allow that, you know, don't, don't feel like, well, you know, I promised I'd stay here till June, 2023. So it's gotta be June, 2023. If gotcha. you decide halfway through that the interim is strong and now you've made that bridge and they want to be part of that work, allow yourself the ability to step back if you need to. Um, uh, and then um, at least one person was kind of wondering if you had a general timeline for when this kind of work is done and the vestry would come together to make the ultimate decision. Yes, I can answer that. Uh, the, the conversations that we've been having and this one today is gonna go off to the vestry retreat, which is in two weekends. And it is my expectation, please don't hold me to this, but depending on how that goes, I'm hoping that we will have some kind of decision made in May. This is not gonna go on in perpetuity, trust me. <laughs> okay, so that's my thinking at the moment. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Terry Amon, and I represent this fine group over here. Um, we talked mainly about option three with the recognition that um, transition is scary. And personally, I can say that if you talk to anyone who was here in this parish 22 years ago, you will hear stories of you know, the horrors that they endured and, are, and all of that is dredged up again with, with this process. But um, one of the strengths of Flo is that she has great knowledge of the people in the diocese and there is a hope that she would share her wisdom in helping to choose an interim or, or you know, nudge the right person to, to appear for us. Um, but we also have questions about the finances, which some other people have mentioned. It's just what exactly does option three look like in terms of compensation for flow. We certainly don't want to say, you know, you got your pension, so now keep working for us for free. But is it a salary? Is it a <laughs> consultant fee? So, you know, those are details that we're interested in talking more about. That's great. Okay, next group. Who wants to go next? Go ahead. Dana. Huh? New I vestry the new vestry I love the new vestry <laughs> members. <laughs> new vestry members stepping up to the plate. Hi, I'm Dana. Um, interesting enough, budget never came up in our group. I right up to the microphone, that. Dana, you have to have closer. Budget to. never came up in our group. Um, our group does still have a lot of questions regarding the process. Exactly, well, what is an interim further clarification of that? Um, Flo, you just answered, when will this process start? Um, how you go about selecting a new priest? So a lot of questions still exist for our group. 
Um, we're not interested, our group collectively is not interested in pulling off the Band-Aid as <laughs> other groups have been. So we saddled, <clears throat> excuse me, between option one with a co-rector and option three. Um, and looking at two, the question came up, what does Flo want? Um, very much want to know what you're interested in doing. Um, comment was made about option three seems like an option that energizes Flo. Um, so looking at that option, is that something that she would gravitate to? Um, but then looking at also option one, where we've had enough of pulling off the Band-Aid over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of jolt. Jolt was a word that was used um, and just looking at how can we balance this transition? <laughs> okay, that's it. Right. Okay. Go ahead, Leah. Leah Culp. Um, my, my group worked within a consensus that we were more interested in option two than option three. And we didn't even discuss option one. But uh, we felt option three was intriguing, but had many questions which you've already, uh, you've already discussed in other groups. Uh, particularly, um, we were interested uh, to know where the money was coming from for Option 3, <laughs> and also uh, in recognition that there's already a, a large, um, a strong lay ministry in Hope Harbor. I was intrigued by um, Dave's um, discussion of, of his small group because that answered some of our questions. Meanwhile, I, I think we had a topic nobody else has mentioned, which was uh, what is the effect of um, postponing zig jigsaw and what has been the effect of um, the pandemic on, on jigsaw? Um, so I want to speak for myself personally. I think Zoom has entered our lives and it will always be here. I am uh, working with a group, uh, cre creation caretakers. Our work is, of course, outside, but we meet monthly by Zoom to, d you know, just to hold conversations. And I don't see that changing. Even if we're able to locomote, we don't want to. It's more convenient to have a small meeting, you know, at your house. So I think Zoom is always with us, and uh, I personally should have asked this question in the annual meeting, and I didn't. And the question is about the tech vergers. What, where did the money come for the electronics? Now, uh, John Schroeder was in our group, and he said it came from a, a special fund that seemed to be earmarked for, that, that it seemed to make sense to put it uh, towards electronics. But I'm thinking in the future, hey, the budget, we're going to have to have um, electronics in the budget and also some consideration for the people who work on it. I know they have internships and stuff, but you know, that's to me um, a job that ought to be on a rotating basis. It has fallen on the shoulders of some mountains, uh, you know, very extensively. <laughs> so I just want to say that Jigsaw is in our concerns uh, for um, option two or option three. But we recognize uh, what, what um, Flo already said, that um, for many reasons, um, the pandemic has changed the way we operate and that we might want to revisit later uh, how to um, plan the physical premises with the addition of electronics. We were, we were interested in the process for canonizing the tech virgins. <laughs> 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 it's, ama it's really amazing what they do. And, uh, and speaking of the, uh, the tech back here, there were some people on Zoom that got okay. cut off, so I'm going to swap it over to Deirdre here, if you'll just give me half a moment and I'll get her going. You know, we are a healthy parish and I trust us and whatever we come to as a body, I, I will co-sign. I do want to say that 
that I believe option three, no one has said this yet, so I'll, I'm saying this to you all. I believe option three is already the work of the Holy Spirit because option three comes from reflect, reflection and prayer and conversation and contribution to what could be uniquely uh, Bartolomaic to allow us to, uh, rather than using the language of, of comparing it to a, a, a wound, we have to take the bandage off, actually allow us because the rector, Flo would retire as rector, actually allow us with Flo rotating into, staying on to what she's already doing with special needs and, and projects and initiatives. I actually see that as a keeping whole. I see that as us keeping whole to who we are and what we want to, who we want to be and what we want to bring to the community. And I, I am uh, just transparently saying that I think option three is very us. And, and, uh, and, and I'm not worried about how we'll pay for it because we'll figure it out, even if there has to be special funds. I believe we'll figure it out if that's what we come to. I believe whatever option we come to, we will do that with God and the money will come. Uh, but I just wanted to say, I think the Holy Spirit's already working in option three. So we don't just have to say, let the spirit do its work. I believe it already is. Thank you. Great, thank you. Patrick, any more from, okay. I think we have one more group to go, is that right? Oh no, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're back here. Hello everybody, my name is Lisette Moody. I'm one of your uh, vestry members, also a tech verger. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Same to say. The only female on the tech verger team too, by the way. So we, um, some of the things have already been mentioned already, just kind of summarizing from the other groups, but the other groups that went ahead, our, our particular group, our lovely group of ladies in the back, wanted just some more clarification on more really option one and option three, because we were going through it and then we just had some questions that already raised exactly what exactly does the interim do, how will they be chosen, that kind of thing. So just kind of reiterating that, um, what are the expectations? from flow during option three, expectations from the church. I know you guys have mentioned that some folks that a fear might be kind of overstuffing some of those expectations or boundaries. So we brought that up as well. Um, this is more of an I statement, but Deidre hit right on it when she was talking. I don't understand, to me, the, the, the analogy of ripping the Band-Aid off doesn't settle well with me because that seems that it's a, a wound of some sort and it's not. What Flo has done, and I've only been here for about four years, has been so impactful. So I can't even imagine those have been here for 10, 15, 20 plus years. And I statement, I don't see, like option two doesn't make sense to me. Having someone just leave abruptly and not even being selfish. Even if I wasn't coming back to this church, let's say I was moving to wherever and I wasn't coming, I wouldn't even want that because I feel like Flo's impact needs to somehow make its way forward with the rector, not stay on forever, because the new rector, they will have their own personality, their own way of doing things. But I think that her impact here is so important, it makes sense to leave. And I, that was my beginning, my stance from day one, even before we had option three. So like, as Radhika mentioned, I think option three is just uh, kind of ordained because it makes sense to leave flow on for those things that really she's made an impact, just to leave on those different, on Hope Harbor, on the many boards she sits on, just wouldn't do justice for her, for our church, and for the community at large. So I totally think that option three makes the more sense, but we also, as a group, we talked about somehow merging if there's a way for option one and three. So in a sense, if, there, if we do pick, um, let me make sure I'm using the right terminology, like if we had some kind of associate rector, but, and Flo is working with that person, can Flo still also do some of the things in option three, but still move, like taking steps back in her responsibility. So we didn't quite know how that would work, if that could work. Um, again, we just wanted clarification, but that was primarily the things that we talked about was just getting better clarification for one and three, and could there be some type of merging of the two? Yeah. Great, Group, thank, you. That, that right? thank you. You wanna say anything? Are you ready? Okay. I think we have one more group. Here. We have another group? We have one more group, don't we, or no? That was slow. You already did. Okay. That then we, we, we did that okay. in good time. Yeah. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate your um, thoughtfulness. And I know that this, um, well, I do. I just, I appreciate your faithfulness and I appreciate your thoughtfulness. I also appreciate 
trying to find the right path, right? And recognizing that this congregation has the strength and the tenacity to do whatever path we're gonna take. So whatever path we're gonna take, it's gonna be fine. Um, and so I appreciate trying to find the right path that is going to help everyone's spirits soar and to make sure that we are making choices and decisions that would best for St. Peter's for the long haul. I think it's really essential. So I really, really appreciate your thoughtfulness, your questions, your concerns, your, your ideas, and things of that sort. And so those will all now go off to the vestry retreat. Um, for those of you who are curious about the financials of option three, don't worry about it. <laughs> we'll figure that out. I'm, you're not gonna pay me my package in option three. So if we go to option three, what you have been paying me, which has been lovely, will be all free for whatever interim that you choose to hire and your next rector. So I'm just saying, don't let the finances curb what is best for St. Bartholomew's. We never have, right? We never have. We've always trusted that the Holy Spirit will arrive in good due term with whatever money bags we need. And so far that's been working. Um, so I would not worry about the financial implications of option three. In terms of the concerns that you have about what each of those options are gonna look like, we can't get to the specifics yet because we have to figure out whether we're even in option one, two, or three. Once we get to where we are, we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics. What I do wanna say to you all is that the, that the process for hiring an interim will not include me at all. I cannot be a part of that conversation or that process. So that would be a small group of people at St. Bartholomew's working with Thelma to put together. Well, I understand. It would be a small group of people working on that process with Thelma, but eventually it's gonna be the vestry that makes that decision. So how those, how those steps exactly work out will be just dependent on where we're going. And that, that process will set some dates. <laughs> that process will set some dates because the one thing I'm gonna to say to you is don't settle. Find the right interim. Just like I'm gonna to say to you, find your next rector. Don't settle. Does that mean you're staying until they find an interim? Pretty close. Pretty close. I'm not gonna walk out on you all while you don't have an interim that you are feeling really good about because then you'll settle. Then you'll settle. And so one of the things that I think is really important for us to understand is that um, whatever path we take, I promise that we will finish that path in a way that is healthy and whole and appropriate, okay? All right, we need to end because Olivet is coming to worship, right? Yes. And yes. that's pretty cool. So we're gonna just quickly sing our last hymn, our last song is on the back page of the booklet. And